And I really enjoyed the presentations. It's too bad that uh, Timothy has to go. Uh, I appreciate uh, a lot of what I've heard. Uh, Deepak, I really agree with you. Fresh water and water is very important. So it's much more than land alone. Okay, so let's see. I'm an agronomist, so I'm not going to uh, show models I developed or economic models or things that I've done. What I've been looking at is uh, if it would be possible to see what indirect uh, complications, indirect inf uh, effects of uh, biofuel production increase in the U.S. could be captured, especially when it comes to land use change. So this is a, a slide presenting, let's say, uh, not the mess, but let's say the situation where we're in. There's a real lack of uh, consensus. The data and the tools are maybe... Well, they're not complete and they're not covering the situation to the extent that we want. So there are all kinds of, of, of uh, issues with ILUC uh, uh, assessment, especially ILUC modeling. So that is one one question. What model would you use? And one of the answers, was, I think, given, uh, given my Deepak, depends on the answer that you want. So I don't want to be cynical. So I'm just going to a situation where we're going to look at uh, let's say a real world uh, data and uh, projections to that and then compare the outcomes. So if we look at the framework that we're going to use today, you can see if we have a biofuel policy leading to uh, increased biofuel production, in this case, ethanol in the US, uh, you need more crops. So we all agree on that. Uh, and we have heard a lot about crop prices. If you have a higher demand, then the price will go up. No economist will uh, uh, disagree with that. As a consequence of the higher prices, in many cases, it's projected that there are changes in the global markets. And this way, uh, in this case, I'm going to present it uh, very simplified that uh, assuming the, the U.S. would have higher internal crop prices, especially corn prices, then their exports would go down. So that would have a trade impact and other countries would step into that, as Timothy said, because uh, what you do is you take a decision, hey, we can make more money because there's a higher demand. In this case, that would be leading to a deforestation in Brazil. What is not really in many of the analysis is this part, and this is in blue, and this is the internal um, uh, dynamics that uh, we find in the U.S. Animal feed market is one because corn is mostly used for feed, but also internal changes that you could have in land use. I'm going to uh, discuss a little bit more on that. So what are we doing? I'm going to compare basically two narratives, uh, one saying, OK, uh, increased demand uh, is going to lead to a shock price shocks, as I said, capital land markets will be involved, will be affected, higher prices that have been mentioned before, and that will in the end result into uh, uh, changes in, the, let's say, the global uh, crop production and especially the land markets. So there's a difference, there's a clear distinction between products like corn in the case of the harvested area and the crop area, including the the, the forest or uh, let's say the land land cover. I'm, co I'm coming back to that, yeah. So this is the most, uh, let's say the dominant narrative and uh, I have, uh, we have named it the trade and market response nar narrative. So there's, there's an impact in trade and markets. There's also a narrative that is more focusing on the, let's say, the technical part and the internal dynamics of, in this case, the U.S. food and feed uh, production and use system. So that is uh, defining that we have more changes than only just the biofuel. So it's broader and there's also including preferences population. And then uh, you can see um, uh, the response is also more dynamic. And it assumes, I think, a higher dynamic, uh, 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 dynamic character and a higher, a higher capacity to adjust. And we're going to uh, see more of that, and then you can conclude for yourself. So elements of this narrative are that there is an op opportunity 
in the crop production system, in this case in the US, for example, to increase cropping intensity. I'm going to explain to you what it is. But also we're going to have uh, options to invest more in the infrastructure, which also can have an impact and crop rotations can change. So these are two narrators that are basically opposing each other. They cannot uh, be, let's say, followed in the same time. Uh, but I think that extremes that are uh, interesting enough and uh, helpful for us to understand what the models and the papers are projecting and what we can see in, in reality. So I'm going to compare a few uh, uh, model studies, including certain, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Tim is gone because I would like uh, to have this uh, response and no doubt he will find me afterwards. Also uh, work from the, the Food and Agriculture Policy Research Institute in Iowa, FAPRI, uh, and consequential LCA models like uh, uh, Miguel has been uh, working on uh, for a, a, a lot of uh, uh, his time and as he is presenting so well. So we're going to look at basically mostly of the papers that follow this trade and market response narrative, which, as I said, is like uh, dominant over... Um, uh, the other uh, internal uh, adjustment uh, narrative. Uh, I'm going to focus on price effect and trade because these are basically the instruments that we need if we want to have a transfer from uh, changes and uh, uh, responses in the US to the global market. And I'm going to focus on Brazil, but that's just a simplification, as I said. In the end, I'm going to present some time series and observation data. So important for us and important for me to explain to you is what would be the route, how the domestic change in the U.S. following the policy and the increase in ethanol production, how could that be translated to any land use change in Brazil? We know, yes, price, 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 but we need a more uh, uh, a clear instrument for that, and that will be the trade. So if we compare both uh, uh, approaches again, uh, trade and market response, they have a really, uh, they uh, make an adjustment estimation. These are usually done in advance or ex ante model studies. What would be the impact if we would change the policy like this? Then you can see that uh, the ethanol and corn demand would, uh, ethanol production corn demand would, would uh, increase. That would lead to a shock price changes would have, and then would have changes and cor corrections in markets and exports. I've mentioned it before. Uh, the internal adjustment uh, narrative studies, they tend to have a lower projection of the expansion. So they're a bit more conservative and they focus on the flexibility and crop life to production and use, not only production, but also the use. How are we gonna use it? And what's, what, what, what's, uh, what will be the impact of that? So if you look at these studies, they predict some land use changes, but not so much as in uh, the, the, the other narrative. And and also changes in land efficiency. So there's mitigation internally. What is important here is that uh, as we look at the carbon of uh, the carbon impact of biofuels, the, the question is how does these changes, how does this story affect the carbon effects? I think we we could talk a little bit more on that. So I'm going to show you a few studies. So this is from the FAPRI model. As I said, I'm not going to uh, uh, lay out all the, the the details of this work. It has been uh, published by uh, IEA Bioenergy as a co-production of uh, multiple uh, task groups. I just want you to focus on the blue part, which is the trade. So you can see here, this is a, a projection that was done, I think, in... in, in um, and to, I'm not sure, I think it was 2009, and they said most of the changes, most of the, the demand, let's say the, the generation of uh, uh, corn that is needed to produce the ethanol but will come from an area in, increase, uh, some yield effect. Be, these together, they make up 55%. And trade is interesting, there's hardly any change in trade. Here they say 0.7 million ton uh, a, re, uh, uh, a change in the corn trade as a result of the increase by fuel production. So this is the Searchinger paper. This is a totally, di a totally different picture. You can see here on the left that uh, the trade is much more important. You can see on the right in the table, there's a decline that is projected for corn uh, export, for wheat export, soybean, you name it, also livestock production. And this is all because in the domestic change in the US system, Corn will become more expensive. They lose their uh, position on the world market and also livestock production based on the corn will also be more expensive. So that is basically 
the core of this this uh, projection as it was published in two, 2008. Miguel has also uh, presented this work very well. You see, it's not it's not so high, but still a trade is is uh, affected. This is another study, and uh, uh, interestingly enough. They do follow the trade market response, but they exp expect less trade effects. It's all yield. So this is also an option. You don't see this too much, uh, but it's interesting to see that there's a diversity of that. Uh, and uh, of course, this will have implications. And this is what we have seen, uh, what we see if we look at the statistics. So as a result of the introduction of the biofuel policies in 2005, this is a 10 period window that we are evaluating. We see an increase of corn use by 92 million tons, which is basically uh, uh, similar the, uh, to men, uh, most study searching uh, was projecting a little bit more, uh, flug a little bit low. So th th there's a variation, but th 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 that is not so much difference, although there's, there's, there still is difference, but the most important difference is when it comes to the exports. And what we see, so what we have seen, and I will show you uh, the, the data, is that although the corn price went up, especially on the short term, as it was projected, in one or two of the earlier presentations. Thank you for that. It was really good to look at that. Uh, uh, you could see some changes in the, in the, the internal uh, the use of uh, feeds. Also, you could see that the, the, the DDGS production output was also used to compensate for that. And as a result, the net export de decline was very, very small. So although we can see that the corn production in Brazil has gone up in these same periods, there is no trade impact here. So we cannot say that the, the, Bra the Brazilians have stepped in where the, uh, the, uh, the US uh, stepped out. Okay, this is uh, some trend lines just to show you what we see. The corn area indeed is increasing. It is quite a lot, but it's very difficult. I'm sorry, I uh, uh, flagged out the, 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 the years. The, there is an, uh, a bit of increase um, uh, early after two, 2005, but on the whole, we cannot say that it is a, is a permanent because it, it basically adopted to the long-term trends. So this is for corn, but when we look at the lower figure, you see that the cereal area in the US is declining. So it's going up, but it's, it's certainly not increasing, and especially not increasing to the same extent that the corn area is expanding. So this means that corn is increasing in, in uh, cultivated area, but it is uh, going at partly at the extent of other crops, other cereals, that is. Here we see an overview of the prices, the price fluctuations, and the exports. Uh, you see that after 2005, there has been a price increase. Then it went down, but the real spike was in 2012, where there was a drought situation. And you can see the price there are really going up and down because after the the the, the spike in 2012, as I said, because of the drought, you could see that it came back to a level in 2016 to 2017, which is more or less in line with the long-term trend. So I did not compare this to other type of uh, price changes. And uh, uh, I would be really interested to see, uh, uh, to compare this to the price index, but uh, unfortunately I had no time for to do it. More important and more interesting is what we see in the changes in the import and export. So the, the export is, is, is uh, the highest, of course, import changes so much, but basically the, the only substantial import was in 2012 and 2013. When we look at the export, you can see that following 2005, the export did not decline. It did increase, and at the first point, and only in 2010, it was at the same level, basically, that it was before the introduction of the biofuel policies. So although there was a price effect, and you can see there was a price hike, it, it was some co a correction, and then oh, but maybe uh, it was beyond what was, let's say, uh, the, the trend line. You could see that this price effect was not translated into a decline of the exports. And this gives us a bit of a dilemma. Yeah? So... Although we know that the, uh, the price has been changed, uh, we cannot say that this price effect has been uh, uh, transferred to other markets uh, because there was no dip in, uh, in the, the trade volumes. 
and we can look at other uh, products as well. And I've done that, but I've just focused on corn. I think the elephant in the room is one: what happens here in in this uh, in this land? Uh, sorry, in this area. So is this flexibility? Is there one of a time occasion? We looked at ten years, and we looked at the US only. Does it also? Do we also have this flexibility in in the EU? Do we also have it in other countries? I think we do, but I did not check that. And also, I think what is more important is, um, do we really understand uh, in our project, uh, let's say economic studies and it, the trade studies, do we really understand what is going on? This is one of the figures I think that has been really uh, uh, helpful for me. What you see here on the, on the right, you see barley. And uh, you can see that the barley are average harvest in the US uh, in 2000, around 2010, is uh, uh, 3.9 ton per hectare. What we see is over the period uh, that we are looking at, that barley and other soft uh, cereals are being uh, 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 replaced partly by uh, by corn. And if you look at the corn yield, which in, in the US is, is uh, an average of close to 10 ton, this is a very interesting situation because then if you take out the ethanol, which would then uh, be around 5.7 ton per hectare, equivalent of the let's say of the the the, the weight, you would still have DDGS that is an, a, a potential or a very strong animal, feed, which is higher than the barley yield. So this is example, but it is really very relevant as I said because the cereal area is declining, which means that maize is is increasing. It would be interesting to look at the water effects of that. I don't know that, but uh, I, as I said, I agreed with Deepak. That is, uh, I think, uh, something that is quite uh, revealing and neglected. Uh, this is uh, some old data that I took. Uh, uh, this is between 2000 and 2010. I think what is important here, when we look at the changes in agriculture area over this period, you see that over a, a time period of 10 years, uh, there is a loss of almost 50 million hectare of agricultural area. This is uh, uh, agriculture cover. So uh, I, I understand that uh, uh, agriculture has been uh, monitored to expand, but it's also losing area. And this is this land is going to other sectors. So when it comes to a carbon price or a carbon impact, my question is, would not the this carbon uh, the loss that is caused by the, this land loss has to be uh, borne by other sectors rather than agriculture because agriculture is losing to trade sorry to to uh, tourism it is losing to transport it's losing to urban areas so basically if we are claiming that area uh, agriculture should be uh, in some way uh, uh, attributed to the the, the carbon loss. Uh, I think we should look beyond that because this also would be a consequential LCA uh, 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 issue in, in my personal uh, uh, opinion. The second uh, row after that is the, the second row to the right is uh, also very revealing. You see that over this period, although almost 50 million hectares were lost, this is area, the increase of cropping intensity has uh, uh, generated more than double the area. So on a let's say uh, uh, on a balance base, you see that the area that is available for food crops over this period has increased. It has not reduced, even although almost 50 million hectares of agriculture area was lost. So agriculture has been shrinking, but the harvested area has been increasing. And you can see on the left that is quite uh, revealing. I don't have the recent data, but I think it is still there. Okay, so mm -hmm. uh, I'll try to. To bring a, a few uh, a few messages for the maybe for the discussion, the the, the model projection that's still leading to conflict uh, conflicting results. So we uh, I think that is very clear. We got two narratives. Uh, they have contradictory findings. We have done analysis for the U.S. Uh, I would be very happy to see this for China, for example, and to see, or for other for other countries, other regions. So please contact me if you want to do this type of analysis. Yeah. Uh, if we look at, uh, I'm going to skip this. So this, you can look at other uh, studies done by the IA. Um, these are some other considerations. Uh, we have a lot of uncertainty in into the the the, the ILAC factors, and there's a tendency to use generic ILAC factors that has also been presented over here. 
uh, this is a warning. We we want to warn against that because there's a really a strong variation. We have just shown that over this 10, 10 year period in uh, in the US, uh, the 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 indirect effect, let's say, the propagation of the the the, the internal effects to other markets could not be uh, could not be found. It doesn't mean they are not there. Maybe they are there, but uh, there's still we have found no evidence of this mechanism, like a, a change in in trade volume has has been occurring. Uh, so again, uh, hypothesis and, and policies uh, of, of effects of policy, they must be, uh, I think, tested more strictly. We use the, 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 the trade models uh, too easily, maybe, and uh, there's certainly not enough, uh, let's say, uh, uh, warnings about uh, how to use and uh, what the interpretation should be done on the outcomes of that. I don't say that models are not good, but it was mentioned before, our models are not good, some are useful, but I think they're only useful if you use them in the context and if you explain to the people who are looking at the outcomes, how you got at it and what are the limitations of that. Uh, there is also a call for uh, to engage stakeholders in 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 in, in more let's say uh, place based approaches, uh, but I think this is basically the uh, the 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 gist of what uh, we wanted to produce, what I wanted to uh, to to present to you. Uh, there's a, a need for variable data. That's very clear. Uh, I'm a very fond of using uh, long-term data trends and to try to look for 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 changes in that and to, to see if, to test if really things are different because of this policy. Uh, I think we are still away from uh, being where we can to predict the changes. So if we cannot look forward with sufficient uh, certainty, let's look back and see what happens. Yeah, and then we can use this to measure policy effects. Uh, it is very interesting also to do causal analysis. I had no time to work on that, but uh, uh, our colleague uh, Debo has done uh, excellent work of this in the US. Um, one important thing is that land management and land cover are uh, totally different. Not every uh, area, uh, ton uh, or ev every hectare that is uh, harvested means an expansion of uh, land cover. That is really something that is too simple. And as an agronomist, I really have a problem with that. So let's see if we can have, get more consistent and more transparent approaches to see we get more standard terms, definitions, baselines, and scenarios to quantify the effects. I think uh, that's it, basically. Thank you so much.